Hey there, Susie here. Before we get into today's episode, I want to share this special message with you. Now, my co-host Michelle and I love masterminds. Not only do we belong to masterminds, but we also host a mastermind. We started it almost eight years ago, and it is the premier mastermind for women business owners who want to grow their business with a specific focus on marketing. Now, this group is usually completely booked out, and very occasionally we open the doors and invite a handful of women in. So if you're growing your business, but you're struggling with feeling overwhelmed, or like you constantly have a split focus when it comes to your marketing, this could be exactly what you're looking for. We have an amazing time together and the women in the group are extraordinary. They're great cheerleaders, supporters, advisors and colleagues for you. And they're also seeing extraordinary results. We see people cracking the million dollar, two million dollar, three million dollar mark, launching new e-commerce sites that go from zero to ten thousand dollars a month in sales. They're doubling their conversion rates, they're growing memberships, they're selling courses, they're growing their personal brands, and they're getting all kinds of media exposure and speaking opportunities and so much more. You can learn more about the Mastermind and join the wait list over at herbusinessmastermind.com. We're going to open the doors soon, so you definitely want to be on the list to get an invitation. So head on over to herbusinessmastermind.com. You're listening to the Content Sales Podcast, the show all about how to create content to attract, convert, and keep your ideal clients. Welcome to episode 218. I'm Susie Daphnis, and here with me is my amazing co-host, Michelle Falzon. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hi, yes, Susie. I'm real well. And <laughs> as a recovering perfectionist, I'm really excited about today's topic. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Our topic today is all about embracing imperfection. Uh, in fact, we believe that imperfection is actually quite beautiful in its own way. And what we found is that striving for imperfection keeps us from launching our new product, from sending that email, from raising our prices, from putting ourselves out there for that opportunity from reaching out to that amazing strategic partner, from putting our hand up for that media opportunity or opening a new e-commerce store or anything great that you might be being held back from can often be because you feel like things just aren't perfect enough. Oh, yes. I know that well myself. Mm, this me is too. To do. <laughs> that has been a work in progress for me for many, many years. I think in my younger years, I was a lot less aware of perfectionism. I really let it kind of rule me a bit, but uh, definitely in the last, you know, shall we say a couple of decades, Mm -hmm. uh, but more so really in the last sort of decade or so, I've really become, this is a work in progress for me. This is something I've really focused on. And our big message on today's show is to embrace what's imperfect in your life, in your business, in your message, in the amount of experience you have and go for it anyway. And we're going to be sharing some of our personal top tips and observations around this topic based on our own journeys of embracing imperfection. And also what both Susie and I have seen, you know, we have worked with literally hundreds and hundreds Mm. of business owners that we support. And we're going to be sharing some of the insights that have really helped them uh, to break through in many of the ways that Susie was sharing at the start of the show. And, And Susie, one stat that I learned many years ago and that has stayed with me is a study done by two US psychologists, Dunning and Erlinger. And this was, I read this and it just kind of like went deep into my core. And they gave male and female college students a quiz on scientific reasoning. And before the quiz, the students rated their own scientific skills. So they haven't even done the quiz yet. And they've said, hey, well, just tell us, just rate yourself. What do you think your skills are? And the women rated themselves more negatively than the men men did on scientific ability. On a scale of one to 10, the women gave themselves on average around a 6.5 and the men gave themselves a 7.6. And when it came to assessing how well they answered the questions after the quiz, so they've now done the quiz, the women thought they did even worse. They said they got 5.8 out of 10 questions right, while the men said they Mm. got 7.1. But guess what? Then the scientists went and actually read the quiz, actually marked the quizzes and saw what was the reality. Mm. The average was almost the same for the women and the men. Women got seven and a half, right, out of 10, and men got 7.9. So it was like mm. line really ball. Really close. 
mm. really, really close. So the men were about right. They were estimating <clears throat> how they actually did quite accurately. There was this possession of their own ability, I guess, yes. their own mm. awareness. But the women drastically underestimated their performance. Now, play that underestimation out a bit further. In the study, the students were then invited, and this is the bit that, like, hurts me deep into my spirit. They were invited. Now, they hadn't yet been told how they performed. They're still Mm -hmm. just with those ratings, women underrating themselves. They were invited to participate in a science competition for prizes. So, you know, insert whatever your opportunity is in front of you right now, that opportunity to speak on that stage, to make more money, to work with that great client, to make that awesome connection, to go on that trip, whatever it is. What is those? What are those prizes that we're holding ourselves back from? So the women were invited, or everybody was invited to participate in the science competition for prizes. The women, remember, they're thinking they'd done much worse than they actually had, were much more likely to turn down the opportunity only 49% of the women signed up for the competition mm. compared with 71% of the men. Like they didn't even put themselves in contention. And I think this is just such a powerful example of what's happening all the time for women in business. I know I've run that racket in my own mind, but it's keeping us out of the game. And we're drastically underestimating how good our performance actually is. Mm. And I think this really does show up with even things like the rate at which women business owners will hit that $100,000 mark or the speed at which they grow because we have that self-doubt. And I see it all the time with incredibly capable and accomplished women really playing down their achievement and their capabilities. And here's where it gets interesting is so we've got this situation where women can be prone to underestimate how well they're actually performing. And then we'll couple that with the fact that in general, women can also be incredibly hard on themselves, as you said, in terms of their criteria for success. And you get this perfect storm. And What happens there is that we're second guessing ourselves when we could be out there stepping into the next opportunity and owning more space and really stepping into our own. Now, it's a really high bar that we place on ourselves. And of course, we're being very general um, as far as um, who it applies to. But there's more evidence. And this is something, this is a stat that Michelle, you shared with me. And it's something that Hewlett Packard discovered several years ago when it was trying to figure out how to get more women into top management positions. Now, a review of the personnel records found that women working at HP, they applied for a promotion only when they believe they met 100% of the qualifications listed for a particular job, whereas men were happy to apply, this kind of makes me giggle a little bit, when they thought they could meet 60% of the job requirements. And at Hewlett-Packard and in a study after study, the data confirms that too many overqualified and overprepared women will still hold back even while less qualified men step into the space. And women very often feel confident only when they've got it all sorted out. They've checked every box. It's all perfect or practically perfect. And the reason I say I laugh is because I imagine all these men with half-baked skills Mm. just, you know, putting themselves forward confidently. And it's, but, you know, where does that leave us? Not putting ourselves forward. And that there, that is the kind of the crime. Yeah, it really is. And when you think about the impact of that on the world, like if you think about just that potential that's staying inside women, Mm. that's not finding its way into the global conversation, into the global marketplace, it is a crime. It is. It's something that gets, I've gone all goosey from head to toe, Susie. I'm getting a bit passionate here. Uh, (laughs) I love that. (laughs) It's a little science-y. It's a bit of science and a bit of heart right out of the gate here. And I want to share another little sciencey thing. Um, Many of you are probably familiar with this, the Dunning-Kruger effect. In fact, I have uh, an in-joke with a friend of mine that says, um, you know, um, you don't always know you're in the Dunning-Kruger effect club. That's like the great problem because the Dunning-Kruger effect is a type of bias, cognitive bias, in which people believe they're smarter and more capable than they are. (laughs) And Dunning and Kruger are two human beings, two scientists. And in fact, Dunning is um, one of the scientists that was in that earlier study that I mentioned before. So Dunning and Kruger found that unskilled people will tend to grossly overestimate their abilities, specifically because they're unskilled. 
Mm. Meanwhile, highly skilled people will tend to underestimate their abilities because they don't realize just how high above average they are. And it makes sense, right? Like I know the more I know about something, the less of an expert I feel. Right. Same, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, this is this is the the thing that I want to kind of share right now is that oftentimes when we're second guessing ourselves or we're thinking, oh well, I know these ninety nine things, but I don't. I know there's like ninety nine more things. Mm-hmm. Just pause for a moment and remember, you probably knowing those ninety nine things, you're probably already like fifty nine to eighty nine things ahead of most other people in that space. Right. So. In many situations, women are more likely to underestimate their abilities while men overestimate theirs. That's what we were just sharing before and what Susie just showed in that Hewlett-Packard study. But these um, misjudged self-assessments, which is really what we're talking about, self-assessments, if we're misjudging that, we're either thinking we've got more skill sets than we have or we're underestimating our skill sets, it can really mess with us in terms of how we're how we're actually perceiving the situation and how we're able to function in that situation. So if we're, um, you know, thinking that we've got all these abilities because we're quite naive and ignorant, then we've got this misplaced overconfidence. But what I think is actually happening a lot for the women that I see in the business world is that we're underestimating our abilities. So we've got this underconfidence. We're holding back unnecessarily. And I know I've definitely had this experience many times in my own life where I've felt things had to be absolutely tickety-boo perfect before I could move forward and that I wasn't qualified when in hindsight I totally was. I'd love to read. There's a particular boardroom I'd love to revisit in my 20s that I was in and just with the mindset that I have right now. And it wasn't until I heard some of these stats and really became aware of this unconscious bias that I had that I could do something about it. And one big thing that I have really worked on doing, this is something I'm doing about it, is leaping before I've overcompensated. Now, what do I mean by that? I think when we feel like we're not enough, when we feel like we don't, we aren't qualified, when we haven't got all the things, we can tend to overcompensate. Like I've got to go and get another qualification, or I've got to go and write a thousand more words on this document, or I've got to go and read 20 more things, or I've got to go and add 50 more slides. And when I feel myself moving into that overcompensation, I cut it off. I go, no, press send or go or make that phone call. And I've really been trying to short circuit that because done is better than perfect. I have a friend, a male friend, and Susie, I would say he's in that, you know, he's got 66% of the qualifications (laughs) kind of thing. Um, And he has been so incredibly successful, like unbelievably successful. He's a multi, 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 multi multi-millionaire. And when when we, I was working with him, uh, helping in one of his businesses, he would put stuff out. It had terrible spelling, like mistakes all the way through it. Ideas were half thought out, but he was doing it. I was sitting there making sure everything was perfect and had every I dotted and T crossed. Mm. And meanwhile, the opportunity train had already left the station with Mm. him on it. And so he's grown several, bought and sold and grown. I'm twitching. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, but I learned so much from him Mm. um, around that. It was like, look at what the world can tolerate. He's put this out there in pretty big rooms with pretty big people and pretty big high stakes situations. And it didn't matter. Because what did matter was that he was showing up, that he was taking action, that he was stepping out, that he had the passion. And so imperfect action is super powerful. You can take imperfect action quite quickly when that window of opportunity opens. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we're sitting over here making it perfect. The window of opportunity closes and then we butt our heads up against the glass and wonder why. So watch out for it. Start practicing sort of intervening when this desire to overcompensate or even that just try and get everything absolutely perfectly lined up before you take action kicks in. Mm. And I'm only actually half kidding about the twitching because I know <laughs> that, um, uh, you know, there's there's a line between uh, perfection and excellence and both perfectionism itself isn't of interest to me at all, but excellence is. And I think I can get caught up on mm. what is excellent enough to put out there. And I too, I've worked with very successful people who had these half-baked campaigns and ideas and just things that, but they were out there. Mm. They were tinkering and 
mm. crossing the I's and dotting the T's. They were just getting the offers out there. And an offer out there and an imperfect offer out there is going to bring in more than an offer that's sitting in your head or that has <laughs> been, you know, released to the world. And I so know. I think thinking about what we do with this MVP mindset, so this minimal viable product mindset, can be really powerful. So how can you put that idea out into the world, that offer, that launch with just the minimal number of pieces? So say you're launching a membership, you don't need to have a year's worth of content already mapped out. You can start now and build it as you go. Same goes for a course or a coaching program. It can also apply if you're doing your very first webinar and you know you've seen people create multiple um, complex webinar funnels and you don't have the capacity to do all the things that they that you might be witnessing them doing, so you do nothing. But what if instead you just did it? in the minimal viable way. And instead of having a fancy tech platform, you just stream straight into Facebook. And instead of having a crazy, awesome landing page, you just had them email you. You know, just what is the minimal viable product that you could learn from, take those lessons away, and then do it a little better the next time when you have a little more confidence, a little more experience, perhaps a little more budget, but you're just on your way. What if you didn't expect it to be perfect or the best promotion ever, but instead you just made a start? And I, I you know, admit I find it hard to not tick off all the boxes of something that I want to do or when the team is putting a promotion out to the market, but I just force myself to do it and to give myself the opportunity to learn. And sometimes, and maybe this is true for you, Michelle, sometimes time is just the catalyst. It's like, uh, this has just got to go. I'm out of time. I can't stop tinkering. And suddenly the important becomes important and other things sort of go to the side. But um, this reminds me of uh, someone I met in the very early 90s. She's an incredible um, teacher and um, trainer. Her name is Dr. Stephanie Burns. And she has literally trained thousands of people around the world to learn new skills from horse riding to drawing, to speed reading, to how to be an awesome trainer, how to overcome limiting thoughts and what you can achieve. Um, now she's worked with organizations like NASA and ABC TV and large companies, but also with everyday mums and dads and teens and kids. And when I met her, she was running a program called Learning to Learn Guitar. And the program actually taught large groups of adult beginners to play guitar. And I remember her confessing that when she started teaching the program, she herself was still an early student of guitar. And so she knew just a few more chords than the students were going to be learning that week. And every week there would be a new class and every week she'd be just that one or two steps ahead of where her students were with their guitar learning. Now, this is a bold example of just forgetting about perfectionism and just getting it done imperfectly. But so many of us want to have it perfect. Now, I know that Stephanie had the confidence in a couple of things. She had an understanding of the adult learner and she knew that she could teach people to learn and that her ability to make this a minimal viable product and make it work because she would just keep ahead of where she needed to be as a teacher. And that confidence, you know, helped her help thousands of people learn how to play guitar. But if she waited till she was Santana, then we would still be waiting, <laughs> possibly, mm. you know, no shade on her, but that, you know, it, we only want to be perfect. And you may know experts in your field who are less expert than you, and they are out there teaching what you know, and maybe you're even a bit critical of them because you know that you know more, but that knowing more, it's not helping you. Mm. because they're out there, they're doing it, they're sharing the knowledge, they're building the audiences, they're becoming recognised, they're becoming the authority. Well, we might be waiting for it to be just perfect before we can release it to the world. Mm. So good, so good. And I love the example and what you learned from uh, Stephanie about just being those few steps ahead, you know, and, and being prepared to own that self-assessment that I now can teach other people this. Yeah, and uh, it's so powerful because we can sometimes be Santana, you know, and we still mm. think we're not good enough to teach guitar mm. in mm. our respective fields. So um, somebody I've learned some things from around this same kind of area is a woman called Dr. Claire Zamet. She has a PhD actually in really focused on how women um, learn and grow and reach fulfilment. And she has this really fantastic phrase called 
I can be brilliant and imperfect. And it's this idea that two things can be true at the same time. And I was thinking about what you were saying before about uh, excellence, you know, Susie, and I think we sometimes equate excellence with perfectionism. I think you're very right about that. And I think this is a way to help unpick some of that, that I can be brilliant and amazing and still have a typo on my email or have a web page that is embarrassing. Like maybe I do have one of those embarrassing web pages. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just being able to hold that tension to know that just because there's some imperfection, just because there's a typo, just because everything's not all dialed up to 100 doesn't diminish the brilliance that you have. And I think this is a really powerful lesson for all of us, male or female, but I think the women in the room are probably nodding their heads quite a bit at this episode because we can be brilliant and imperfect. We do not have to be perfect to be brilliant. I love that. So good. She's a wise woman, that Claire. She sure is. I will have to look her up. I do not know her. So what is her area of expertise? Uh, she has a PhD in uh, like so, some of it's adult learning, but specifically she's focused on women. So she does a lot mm. around women-centered coaching, actually, and mm. women's empowerment. Love it, love it, love it. So here are some ways that perfectionism could be showing up. And remember, this episode is about our top tip tips for overcoming perfectionism. So we are getting there. But ways that perfectionism could be showing up is that you don't want to fail. And I've never met anyone who's like willingly, yeah, I'm going to go fail. (laughs) Uh, It might be hard to take feedback or you find that you delay and you procrastinate or you're missing deadlines because it has to be perfect or over-investing in things that really didn't need that much time or input or you don't want to take risks or you get stuck in a rut or it can be hard to experiment or just get something to market just to see how it lands and then improve on the fly, as we talked about a little earlier. And if that is how it's showing up for you, um, it's not a criticism. It's really quite normal. I could totally (laughs) understand, but it doesn't have to stay that way. So we're going to look at some ways to overcome perfectionism. And the first is the power of the pause and becoming aware that you are actually Um, noodling on imperfection, that that is what's holding you up, that is really important. And when you can become present to the times that perfectionism is showing up, you know it's no longer running you. It's no longer unconscious. Now you know, oh, look, there it is. That's what's holding me up. That's why I keep tinkering with this Canva thing. That's why this ebook still hasn't gone out. That's why that webinar still isn't launched. That's why I still haven't called that potential client. Now, you because or given them their proposal because oh maybe I just need to tinker with the testimonials one more time. You can choose to do it a different way. You can try some different self-talk. We're talking a lot about mindset today. So what could you say to yourself when this behavior shows up? Could you use that quote? And I don't know whose quote it is, Michelle, that originally, but the done is better than perfect. That is a great one. Okay. I've got it done. I have shipped to use a Seth Godin term, ship it. Like get it out, get it done, Um, or being a little more curious. Like, okay, I'm going to try this and see. Or thinking this is an experiment, right? My whole life is riding on this. This is an experiment. Let's just try it out. Or look, let's just get this thing done and move on because there's other more important things that could use my time. They could be some different ways to change up your self-talk. And we'll pop these on the show notes as well just so you have them as easy reference. I love the practicality of that, you know, just that way to short circuit when we can be looping around in our perfectionism. And I have uh, another one. This was one actually shared with me by a friend of mine, actually a, a guest on this podcast, Victoria Labam, and it's actually an old builder's saying. I think I recall my grandfather saying this. And the phrase is, if you can't fix it, feature it. And I have found this has really been medicine to my perfectionism, my perfectionistic soul. (laughs) So the builders would say like, hey, if you can't fix that hole in the wall, how can you make a feature of it? Like, let's turn it into a fireplace. And I have found this incredibly liberating and it actually creates a lot of creativity. Things do not have to be imperfect. And I 
sorry, things do not have to be perfect. And I can relax if I find an imperfection. I can actually lean into it. I can feature it. I can let it be a doorway mm. to something else. Because I think when we see something that's imperfect in our world and what our work or what we're doing or what we're putting out there, we can have a tendency to sort of put our finger in it and say, yeah, see, that's why I can't, that's why we can't have nice things. <laughs> that's why I can't be on stage. That's why I can't work for the big bucks or whatever it is, whether that's conscious or unconscious. Um, but if we can reframe that imperfection and go, look, when the imperfections show up, I'm confident that I can turn this into something positive. I can, you know, go from lemons to lemonade, so to speak. So like, let's just say you couldn't get back for a Zoom meeting um, and you're out in your car, just drive by the beach and feature it. Feature the fact that you're at the beach and that you're somebody who is able to you know, have this life where you can combine the things you love. And suddenly you've opened a doorway onto people knowing more about you, liking more and admiring you more rather than you kind of going, oh, I can't get back to the Zoom meeting. I'm going to have to cancel and um, I'm terrible and, you know, it's all going to be perfect. I'm going to be sitting in my perfect office with my perfect hair. Um, If we can allow to, when those imperfections show up, when those failures or those blips show up, if we can, instead of, if we can't fix it, let's just feature it. Let's just lean into it because not only is imperfection beautiful, but being authentic is beautiful. Being imperfect is relatable. If you have a community of people who look to you for advice, who you are, um, you know, leading in some way, you do not have, I just want to relieve you of the pressure of having to be perfect all the time. When you can show that it's not perfect, people will actually lean into you even more. They'll believe you even more. They'll trust you even more. Always keeping things perfect is so freaking exhausting and it's not actually the way to success. You don't have to be perfect to be brilliant. See Claire's earlier point. It's this ironic trap we often put ourselves in. So, and Sudi, this was something I wanted to mention and it it came up um, I almost threw it in before when you were speaking about excellence. But not only do we need to embrace new mantras, but I think we have to let go of the old mantras that are keeping us in these old behaviours. And I was thinking before today's show about a couple of mantras that I told myself very early on. Um, One was, if it's worth doing, it's worth Mm -hmm. doing well. Mm -hmm. And the other was, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. Now, Those things are true. Mm. You know, I like to, if it's worth doing, I like to do it well. And, you know, if I'm going to be sloppy with this conversation with somebody or uncaring with this person, it's reflecting potentially, you know, how I'm with a lot of other people. But it's kind of like you can't let that rule you either because, you know, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well, can have us like obsessing over cleaning the car or um, the way the pantry looks or, you know, the, the email that really should have gone out an hour ago, but we're no, no, doing it's worth doing well. And I've got to fix up this one little bit in the bottom here. And the same with how you do one thing is how you do everything. These two ideas for me can keep me stuck working in stuff that doesn't matter and overcompensating and over obsessing while that window of opportunity is closing. So maybe as you're listening to this, you've got some things, some sacred cows from when you were a kid in your family or ideas that you realize are possibly keeping you trapped in perfectionism. And so I'm not throwing those ideas away. Mm. I'm loosening their grip on me in certain parts of my life where it doesn't serve me. Yeah, right. And you're doing that very consciously because anything that is just kind of automatic in our head, I think we want to pay attention to. Mm. Um, And we're not asking you to be sloppy. I really have no time for sloppy work. In fact, I was looking at a landing page the other day and I knew the person was under pressure. They didn't have a whole lot of time to make changes. And I thought, oh, I won't give them the feedback. I don't want to put pressure on them. And then I thought, no, I'm robbing them of the opportunity of not showing up sloppy. And so... I said, like, do what you can do with this feedback because this isn't, uh, you know, there. we're not saying do it sloppy. <laughs> I just want to say that. The other thing is that sometimes we're going to put it out there and it's going to fall flat. And so making a mistake doesn't mean that you're a failure. And so this is something I do want you to say to yourself is that, you know, that didn't work, but that doesn't mean I'm a failure. That attempt in that way on this day, whatever, maybe it didn't work out, but I'm human. 
people make mistakes, I can learn from this. And, you know, not every campaign is going to work. So everyone has a bad day. So everyone has a bad campaign, marketing campaign from time to time. That's just the way it goes. We just move on. And the other thing is around um, perfectionism is sometimes we really want to be liked. And I've never met anybody who didn't care about people liking them, even if they pretended they didn't. And so if we're trying to cover all bases, please all the people, then um, that could be keeping us stuck. So it is okay for some people to not like what you're putting out there. You don't have to try and please the people all the time. And again, that could be a mantra for you that it's okay if this polarizes some people. I don't have to try and please everyone all the time, right? I just want to appeal to my ideal clients. And really allowing yourself to make mistakes, which again, I know it goes against my grain. It goes against a lot of our grain that we would say it's okay to make mistakes. But really, how do you think about mistakes? Beating yourself up every time you make a mistake or thinking, okay, got it, got the lesson, onwards I move. Now, none of us wants to have something fail or feel embarrassed, but when you know that's just a normal part of growing, you can feel those feelings and then move on and moving on quickly. We can build our resilience to failure. That's what grit is. That's where grit comes in. Grit is that keeping on doing it, that is stick with itness when things aren't fabulous. And if you've been in business for a minute, you know there's going to be periods where things are not working out exactly as you wanted. They're not working out perfect because you're not perfect. So the most successful you did people- there. <laughs> the most successful people, if we look out there and the examples that Michelle gave earlier, they don't have the most perfect marketing or landing pages or teams or anything. They're the ones that <clears throat> um, make mistakes. They keep reaching out. They keep going beyond their comfort zone and they keep growing and learning along the way and they don't let perfectionism keep them trapped right where they are. Yeah, speaker sister. Yeah. And uh, I, I love it, you know, and it is such a, a, it all makes sense in our heads, hmm. uh, but then doing it, 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 it's not always easy. And I want to acknowledge that too, but it's important to keep having this conversation. And um, Claire Zammett, Dr. Claire Zammett, who I mentioned earlier, she calls these edges that you're talking about, like this growing and, and feeling hmm. to that more uncomfortable space. She calls these our growth edges. And I really love this idea, these growth edges. And at the edge of our skills, at the edge of our learning, at the edge of our experience, that's where the growth can happen. Mm. You know, because if we're just happily operating inside our current skill set, we just, you know, comfortable, we just never get better at it. Mm. So how prepared am I to find those edges and expand them? I think this is a great question to ask ourselves. And finding those growth edges and kind of leaning into them and just kind of expanding into them and and welcoming them is something that I love that happens at the reach retreat that happens in Hawaii each year, Susie. I see, you know, women really finding those growth edges and and feeling comfortable about leaning into them. Hmm. Because I think the longer we're in business, we kind of get comfortable with what we know and our zone actually becomes this little bubble that we live in. You know, we probably took bigger risks and extended ourselves more when we were earlier in business. But the reach retreat is for women with established businesses who find themselves that they are stuck inside this comfort zone and they haven't expanded their reach to have a better lifestyle, to create the business that they love, to have clarity and focus, to play a bigger game. And a friend of mine, and a guest on this show, Bonnie Christine, she uh, said, uh, everything you want is on the other side of your comfort zone. And so if it's on your uh, other side of your comfort zone, there's a likely that you're not going to be perfect at it. Because if you're comfortable, you're probably going to have a level of ability that is not that is greater. And so the reach retreat is about those edges that Michelle mentioned. And it is about finding those edges in our thinking, in our connections, in our abilities, in our ability to dream and really starting to push out on those edges, even if it's not perfect. Now, the reach process is a beautiful process that, you know, makes that 
easier to get over the perfectionism, that I don't have to be the perfect business owner, that I don't need to know everything about everything. But what I can do is I can take the experience I have. I can start to create a new vision for myself. I can start to push out on those comfort zones and find these new edges. And I can have a group of women around me who are going to support me in taking that imperfect action forward. So um, the Reach Retreat is something we do every year. It's always a beautiful experience for women who have, you know, they're hitting the uh, edges of their capacity, of their mindset, of who they think they can become. And this just allows us to create these new further out uh, edges. Um, And a lot of that is through embracing uh, imperfectionism, but creating these vivid Uh, beautiful visions for our businesses. So uh, we're going to put the link in the show notes, but if you want to learn more about The Reach Retreat, you can do that over at thereachretreat.com. So good. Go click on that URL right now. I absolutely Uh, love The Reach Retreat and I love what it does for the women. There's something that just clicks through this experience that um, helps in, in so many ways to feel better about those growth edges and to feel better about that authentic brilliant and imperfect self. And so we're we're giving our top tips for overcoming perfectionism. And Susie, you shared a couple of really great ones so far. The power of the pause, which I think is so good. Just give ourselves that beat between, you know, the stimulus and the response. And the other was to let yourself make mistakes, to make friends with making mistakes and be okay about it and pick yourself up and dust yourself off. And another one that I'd love to add is, we've sort of touched on it already, but is to let go of impossible standards. And that really comes back to what we were saying at the start of the show with those stats, that we've set ourselves in many cases these impossible standards. Perfectionism, if we're suffering from it, tends to show up in crazy high standards that we normalise as average or below average. And actually what we are is, is kind of going way, way, way above and beyond what is actually needed in many cases. And something that, uh, I I don't know who first said this to me, um, but there's this great concept of don't judge your back of house on other people's front of house. So what does that mean? If you go to the front of a house of a show, you know, the stage is set, the costumes are all done, all the makeup is on, the rehearsal has been completed, everybody knows their lines, everything's orchestrated, and it all looks like it happens perfectly. But if you go to the back of house, You can see all the chaos that's happening back there, the ropes, the people running around, moving the sets around, the producer tearing his hair out because he can't find the star or, you know, whatever else is going on back there. So you may be looking at that peer in your industry whose Instagram just looks perfect, or you may be looking at um, that competitor for that tender bid whose website just looks immaculate and start thinking, I don't have this, I'm not that, I'm not this, I'm not this. But that's comparing your back of house because you know all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes in your business, but you don't know it about theirs. So just don't judge your back of house on other people's front of house. Just know everybody's got a back of house. It's not all perfect for everybody. So don't hold yourself to those standards that aren't even real out there in the world. So in other words, don't judge your starting line on someone else's finishing line. You know, I've got. Uh, a client right now, he's been doing this for a really long, long time. And so he's a master. He's got thousands of students and he has multi-million dollar business, but he started, he's helping the people at the starting line where he was 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, he was making the same mistakes. He had no clients. He had, he was overworked. He did not have an email list. He did not have all those things. So just realize it's a process and be careful where you're comparing your current reality too, I guess, is the main thing and let go of those impossible standards. And, you know, I I want to talk about the back of the napkin just for a minute because the back of the napkin is this idea that you just grab the nearest thing and you're scribbling on it, you know, and it's, it's that first blush of an idea. It's that first kind of nutting something out. And the back of the napkin is an imperfect place, if you like, but it's the ideal place to play to ideate, to get feedback. And this is something we tell our masterminders all the time, Susie and I, Mm. because they'll come to us, you know, when everything, when they've tried to make it all perfect to get our feedback, they've already written all the emails, they've already done all the sales pages, they've already done everything. And we're like, oh, I wish you'd have come to us 
two months ago before you spent all this time just having drawn it out on the back of a napkin so we could give you some advice at that really imperfect kind of stage. So um, just today, actually, I saw somebody in the group resisting the urge to make their hand-drawn diagram perfect. They just posted the hand-drawn diagram and said, hey, can I get some feedback on this? So letting yourself play, letting yourself get feedback early in the process, sharing your imperfect ideas, of course, in the right audience with trusted people, is also a really great way to let go of these impossible standards we put on ourselves. And ironically, it's a way to get a better result, to get a better outcome. Do I have to work so hard? And um, this impossible standards, I think, applies to what you said, Susie, about people pleasing. It can be such a big one. We want to be loved by everyone. It is mm. such an impossible standard. It's such a lot of pressure. So really letting go of some of the impossible standards that we've put in our own lives. And maybe if you're listening, you can jot down what you think a couple of those impossible standards are. And I want to share with you my little mantra, this has been the last year, it has been such a joyful reframe. I am going to replace one of the words in this mantra because this is not the word I say. You might guess what the word is that I say, but my mantra comes with a little song and a dance. You won't be able to see the dance, but when something is really, when I'm really living. We'll add a gift to the show notes. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> I'm sitting here doing the dance. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But I, I have found I need a real circuit breaker, right? And so when I'm letting the little things worry me, when I'm obsessing about details, when I'm overcompensating, when I'm setting too many impossible standards, when I'm trying to people please and hold all of the attention of everybody and keep everybody happy, I have this moment of realization and I get this, deliberately I get a big smile on my face and I go, ah, oh, I don't have to give a fig about that. I don't have to give a fig about that. I don't have to give a fig about that. I don't have to give a fig about that. And it is such a pattern interrupt. And I find this joy fills me up. And there's this huge relief that I don't actually have to worry about that. And I have found this, I know it sounds really silly, but I have found this so liberating. And so just when it comes to these impossible standards, just find your way to interrupt that because you are enough. You are enough as you are right now. <laughs> if you're a regular listener, you think, what has happened to these two? <laughs> <laughs> this topic do is this. so different to our <laughs> other topics. But, you know, it is holding you back in your content marketing, in the products you're putting out to the market, in perhaps how you're running your business. So um, we wanted to give you these tips for overcoming perfectionism. I have one more, and that this one again, I, look, I just want you to know anything we're saying here today, there's a level of challenge for me. But, you know, sometimes when we make it more conscious, when we put it out there, we start to make shifts in ourselves. So the one that I want to mention is the shift from having to do things perfectly to finding meaning in what it is that we're actually doing. So moving our thinking from this is right or this is wrong, this is good, this is bad, to actually looking for the joy and the purpose um, in what we're doing, which I realize may be easier said than done. And so... I mentioned Stephanie Burns earlier. She used to have a saying, which was, you cannot learn less. And so going, oh, okay, yep, I've just learned something new. I can't learn less. And just enjoying the process of what we do. So often we are so hung up on the outcome, the money in the bank, the number of clients, the budget, um, you know, realizing our goals in our budgets, the end result, and we forget to enjoy the process along the way. And so the joy doesn't just have to be when we get there, wherever there is, when we have all the skills, all the money, all the success. It can be in the process. And there's a spiritual teacher named Esther Hicks, and she um, says, and I won't read you the full thing, but she says, you never get it done and you can't get it wrong. Life is supposed to be fun. You are the creator. You are a, a focusing mechanism. You are here in an environment that is conducive to that. And she talks about how living life, like waiting for something to be perfect, is kind of putting our joy off where what if you just felt good about what you're doing right now, the imperfect marketing campaign, the imperfect hand-drawn drawn diagram, the imperfect organizational chart, the imperfect whatever it is you're working on, but you just kept moving forward with a mood of not, this is imperfect, I hate it, but this is imperfect, isn't that beautiful? 
as we've been saying. I love that. I love that. That is really beautiful. Another thing, as we're just rattling off our tips, <laughs> uh, that I found that works great is to uh, really deliberately dial down the negative influences and dial up the positive influences. And that might be people around you, that might be resources around you, that might be structures that you have in place, that might be things that you're doing, that might be clients that you have, whatever it is, really looking at what is helping me to feel brilliant and imperfect. Uh, and what is making me feel like I've got to have these unreasonable standards and that doesn't allow any room for failure and that doesn't sort of see me and allow me to be my authentic self. So people around you who expect you to be perfect and to live up to unrealistic ideals, maybe they're people you need to pull back a little bit from having, you know, such a dominant sort of influence over your life or your business or whatever it is you're doing. These could be clients, peers, colleagues. How might you dial that down so that it doesn't feel like it's such a loud voice in your ear? And, you know, there are people around you who appreciate you for how you're showing up, who can love you even when you make a mistake, who don't set unrealistic expectations. How can you dial that up? Mm. Who do you know? Perhaps there are some people coming to mind right now that you need to dial down and those you need to dial up. Some activities, some actions, some structures you need to dial down and dial up. Maybe you're realizing you need more people who are positive influences in your life. You're looking around and going, you know what? I need some more of these people. I'm feeling there's some scarcity around this, especially in business. You know, if you've got a lot of friends who aren't in business or you've got family who haven't been in business, this is super, super important that you get some business besties, that you get some people Mm. who see you and your brilliance, even if it's imperfect in a business context. And and Susie, I I mean, that's what I absolutely hand on heart love about what you've created with the Her Business Network for that. Like the Her Business Network is that place. And especially obviously within that part that I'm, you know, really close to is the mastermind. Mm -hmm. It is that place where you can find those forces for good as we're dealing with our perfectionism who do love us and will create space for us to grow even when Mm -hmm. we fail, even when we fall down. Mm. And we say that a lot in the community where people will come and say, hey, I really bombed on this or this is just not working or I'm feeling very imperfect <laughs> um, and they get the support they need to keep moving forward and building communities and being part of communities has been my life's work and it's very much for that reason. Uh, we have three what we call connection moves inside the Her Business community where we um, champion each other. And these are lift up, show up and speak up and lifting up that connection move is about lifting others up so that you can find that community around you, a community that supports you and that helps you rise. The show up move is about what we're talking about here today. It's about being real and authentic and, um, doing the thing, even if you're feeling all those inner voices resisting you all that perfectionism riding over you. And then the speak up move, the third connection move, is about being heard and being seen, not letting opportunities slip by because we're ruminating on things. And having other like-minded business owners around you who share those same values and are on the same path, doing it imperfectly, but doing it with others who are also doing it imperfectly, that is priceless. And that leads me to our final tip for overcoming procrastination. This is tip number six, and that is don't sweat the small stuff. So what small things can you let go of? What could you give fewer figs about, (laughs) to Michelle's point? So notice when you are over-investing and over-compensating, pay attention when you're obsessing over small details and get really clear on the real opportunity and the cost of perfectionism because being stuck here right now, obsessing over small details, over-investing, over-compensating, being fixated on small things, that could be really costing you clients, opportunities, um, impact, success. So I know for me, there's been many a time where uh, something hasn't gone to market because we just needed to prove it one more time to make sure that there were no typos. But we've gotten better at this. We um, we move through a lot of stuff. Like we're very productive as a team. Do some mistakes slip through? They absolutely do. Could we be more perfect? Yes, we could. But it's really about knowing what the small stuff is. I think that's the main thing about 
sweating the small stuff is knowing what the main thing is, knowing the big needle movers, knowing the things that really matter and the things that become nice to haves. Um, so that is tip number six is don't sweat the small stuff. That point about knowing what actually is small stuff, because we can take that small stuff mm. and make it big stuff. Yeah. Meanwhile, the big stuff is like falling over outside, you know, because yeah. we haven't, we've sort of been distracted. I really love that. And I think what you said before too about the pause, that sort of first point you made, that is also so key in not getting caught up in the small stuff. Just giving mm. yourself that beat, that moment between stimulus and response, I found is so key. You can really kind of say, what what's really happening here? Mm. Is this a big thing or is this a small thing? All that pressure to perform is such a deeply held habit. It's like we need to be really deliberate in every, you know, really alert and aware to this. It takes focus and it takes awareness to gradually shift those very kind of deeply held, very well-practiced habits that we have. Mm. Right now we're just on the precipice of going into a, a promotion that, to be honest, I wish I had another four weeks to work on, but the calendar is such that I don't. And so I'm really aware that in many ways it's not going to be as perfect as I wanted, but sweating that small stuff is going to take me away from the fact that this is a wonderful opportunity for the business. It's a wonderful opportunity for the women that are going to come in contact with us over the coming weeks. And it's just been a really good reset just to think about backing ourselves, not sweating the small stuff. And like you said, taking the moment to pause and say, what's really happening here? So I want to uh, recap the six tips that we've talked about in today's episode, and they are just what Michelle um, mentioned right then, and that is the power of the pause. What is happening here right now? Allowing ourselves to make mistakes, and of course, you know, you're going to be doing your best with what you can at the time, what resources you have, but just knowing that something might drop to the floor, letting go of impossible standards, shifting from perfection to finding meaning, dialing down negative influences and really dialing up, really rallying around the positive influences that you can have around you and not sweating the small stuff. That is number six. Uh, we'd love to know what your tactics are for dealing with perfectionism or even what your struggles are when it comes to dealing with perfectionism. So please let us know. The best way to do that is over on our Facebook page. Just search for Content Sales Podcast over at Facebook and you'll come across our page. Uh, and now in a moment, I'm going to be giving you a link to today's show notes uh, because it'll have links to resources we've talked about here today. But just before we do that, I do want to say that we love sharing these tips with business owners and we want to share them with as many business owners as possible. And what really helps with that is having your ratings and reviews. We're really proud of having over 100 five-star reviews. So if you enjoyed today's episode, if you are taking something away, if you've had an aha, would you leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts? We would absolutely be so, so grateful. Uh, and someone who just did leave us um, a comment about a recent episode is the lovely Samantha Konyeshi, who is one of our members. Now, she's been listening to a very popular episode, which is all about features and benefits. When it comes to your marketing, are you telling people about the features of your products and services? Or are you actually conveying the benefits? And that episode dives deep into how to feature, no, I'm not going to use that word, how to focus on benefits over features. So this is what Samantha said. She said, thank you, Susie Daphnis and Michelle Falzon for such a great episode, which was why you need to focus on benefits versus features to make more sales. She said, you really help to define the difference between the two. And it's such an important thing to know the difference between the two when it comes to your messaging. So thank you so much, Samantha. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being in touch with us. And as we said, if you want to get in touch with us, the Facebook page, the Content Sales Podcast Facebook page is the best place. So anything we've mentioned here today, I'm going to uh, go ahead and put on our show notes page, as I said earlier, and you'll find that page over at herbusiness.com forward slash imperfection. That's herbusiness.com forward slash imperfection imperfection. Now we've got another great episode of the Content Sales Podcast coming up two weeks from now. What are we going to be talking about in that one, Michelle? Well, we're heading back to more of our regular programming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next episode is how to get more referrals. So referrals can really be the lifeblood mm. of 
a business. So whether you sell a product or a service, whether you serve other businesses with a B2B type business or you serve directly to the consumer with a B2C business, whether your business is big or small, high ticket or low ticket, referrals really can make a huge difference. So how do you get them? Or if you're getting them right now, how do you get more of them? Mm. How do you get the right kind of referrals? We're going to be covering some of our top referral strategies in the next episode. I'm very excited about that. I love Mm. referrals. I love getting referrals. I love seeing women refer each other. Um, So that's coming up two weeks from now. So if you are new to the show or you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and click that subscribe button and that way you'll get that episode as soon as it becomes available. Um, Michelle, what would you like to say before we go today? I really love a good mantra. And so I'd love to just encourage if you're listening right now to perhaps think what your mantra could be to help interrupt your patterns around perfectionism. And remember, you don't have to give a fig about that. (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I'm going to choose mine is going to be done is better than perfect. Done. I love perfect. it. Perfect, Susie. Susie, done is better than perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time right here on the Content Sales Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now. Bye.